Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Dijkraaf. I'm the director and Leon Levy professor here at the Institute for Advanced Study. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all on this absolutely beautiful spring day to uh, this uh, public lecture. Uh, a public lecture by uh, Mark Goreski, long-term member in the School of Mathematics and a very important uh, member of the mathematical community in the community here at the Institute for a long time already. Mark uh, has uh, made crucial contributions to a wide range of mathematical fields, including theoretical computer science, geometry, topology, representation theory, perhaps most, uh, most well known uh, by the contribution he made uh, together with uh, Robert McPherson, the Hermann Weil professor here at the Institute, in the creation of a field which is called intersection homology, which is uh, for lay people basically some way to deal with very bad spaces, with uh, horrible singularities. And uh, so um, that was actually a major turning point, I think, in, in algebraic geometry, and it's applied in, in a wide range of fields. Mark received his PhD from Brown University in 1976. He served as assistant professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia and a professor of mathematics and computer science at Northeastern University. Uh, he first became a member at the Institute in 1985-86, and then in 1994, he started his tenure as long-term member. Uh, Mark, as th those of you at the School of Mathematics know very well, plays an absolutely important role in the life of the school as an organizing of key, organizer of key working groups and seminar series, including the member seminars. And he has served as mentor to many, many, many postdoctoral researchers here at the Institute. All of that uh, outstanding mathematical work has been recognized by many honors. I just mentioned the Coxeter James Prize and the Jeffrey Williams Prize of the Canadian Mathematical Society. Uh, together with Professor McPherson, uh, Mark was awarded the Steele Prize for a seminal contribution to research from the American Mathematical Society in 2001. And he's a fellow of the Royal Society of C Canada and an inaugural fellow of the American Mathematical Societies. Uh, uh, the amazing thing is that apart from all the work in algebraic geometry and representation theory, Mark has kind of a, s a hidden life. He is also very much interested in engineering and coding, and I think we'll see some of that interest here today in the talk. And you can see this, in, for instance, in his two most recent books, which in one is called Hilbert Modular Forms with Coefficients in Intersection Homology and Quadratic Base Chains. Uh, yeah, you all are rushing to the, uh, to the library, I see. <laughs> And the second one, algebraic shift register sequences, which is really a field and a topic in the, in the field of computing. His lecture today promises to be uh, more accessible, and for me it already wins the prize of the most colorful title uh, of, the, of this year. Uh, you see it projected, a Hollywood celebrity, the bad boy of music, and the history of modern wireless communication. So I think really very tempting title. Uh, we're all very curious to see how that story ends. It's a, a fascinating mix of ingredients. As always, of course, at the end of the lecture, there will be uh, room for questions. And then after that, I would, uh, of course, invite you uh, to uh, Fult Hall, for, uh, to the Commons Room, for a further discussion and reception. But at this point, I invite you to join me in welcoming Mark to the stage. Mark. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's uh, a pleasure to be able to speak about this um, here today. It's a, quite a dramatic story. Um, this is Hedy Lamarr. Uh, she was a screen actress from the um, 1940s and 50s, and she's the first of several personalities that I'll be talking about today. This is her again in, in the uh, film Algiers. So Hedy Lamarr was um, um, born in Vienna. Uh, her, her name was Hedwig Kiesler, and uh, she loved to act. She began acting seriously at age 16 uh, in school plays and in uh, community, community uh, plays. And in 1933, <laughs> she uh, ended up in a film called Ecstasy, uh, which was, by today's standards, not so not so risque, but, but by the uh, standards of the time and the, and the city was uh, considered uh, pretty racy. Fritz Mandel, an, uh, 
from a family of arms manufacturers, um, had, to, had to own her. He, he, he wooed her, he gave her presents, he, he kept uh, knocking on her door, she kept saying no, and finally he convinced her to marry him. He was the third richest man in Austria. <laughs> um, so she sat through many dinner parties for military clients um, and listened, to, um, listened politely to the business of the time. Um, in, the, in the 30s, um, Germany was rearming and, and Austria was part of that. Um, one of the one of the issues that came up at these dinner parties was um, how to develop a radio-controlled torpedo. So, you know, a, um, a ship sends a torpedo towards another ship, and uh, it may take a few minutes to get there. And if the guys on the target ship see it coming, they can just go out of the way. Um, so the, the idea was uh, on the original ship, there should be a, someone watching the torpedo with a radio control, like we used to control model airplanes, for example and uh, he should be able to redirect the torpedo. So it, it follows the, uh, the target ship. But this technique has a problem. If the guys on the, on the target ship detect your radio transmissions, then they might uh, jam those transmissions by sending an even stronger signal um, on the same frequency. Or worse, they might take over the torpedo and turn it around and send it back at you. So. Um, so this was a problem that they didn't know how to solve, and uh, uh, engineers in, um, in Austria were thinking about this. Unfortunately, Mandel was a very jealous type. Um, he, he was very upset by this film, Ecstasy, and he went around the country trying to buy up all the copies <laughs> so, no, so nobody could see, it, see his wife on this film. Um, uh, he expected her to come to these dinner parties and be seen and not heard, to smile, to laugh at the jokes, but not to have any opinions. And bit by bit, he insisted that she drop her, um, her aspirations to act, and uh, it got to the point where she couldn't even um, leave the house without being accompanied by one of his lieutenants, even to go shopping. And so it was just a suffocating situation. And finally, in 1937, she walked away. <laughs> Well, it's a little hard. There's a few different stories about this, and she was deliberately vague. In her, in her autobiography, which was ghostwritten, she says she drugged the maid uh, and, and took the maid's uniform. This seems unlikely, but it seems that she probably had help, and she would never wanted to say really who helped her for, the, for fear of recriminations. But anyway, she, she always insisted it was a, um, a dramatic escape. And so she got away in 1937, along with most of her jewelry, <laughs> um, and made her way directly to England. In, in London, she found um, a, uh, an agent. The agent told her that Louis Mayer of Metro Goldwyn Mayer was in town, and he arranged for her to meet uh, with, with Mayer. And Mayer basically threw, him out of, threw her out of the office. He said, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need any more actresses. But um, she asked around and found that he would be sailing um, back to New York on the um, French uh, luxury liner, the Normandy. And so she bought a first class ticket on the same uh, sailing and uh, showed up on the ship. And of course, on the ship, she was the center of attention. Uh, she was flamboyant, beautiful, she made lots of noise, uh, everybody knew who she was, uh, and she ended up having dinner with uh, um, Louis Mayer and his wife uh, for, most, for most, of the, most of the travels. So she convinced him that she was a, a famous actress, and by the end of the trip, uh, he agreed to sign her up um, uh, under two conditions. One, that she learned English, and two, that she changed her name. And he decided that Hedwig Kiesler was not a very good screen name. It didn't have that catch, catchy sound to it. So he coined the name Hedy Lamar. So this woman walked onto the ship, uh, a refugee from a suffocating marriage, a stranger to the language around her, and she walked off the ship in New York as the actress Hedy Lamar. 
She made films, became famous. This was 1937. Already in 1938, Algiers uh, um, came out with Charles Boyer. Um, there's this famous line, come with me to the Kasbah, which comes from this film. Um, Samson and Delilah with uh, a Cecil, B Cecil B. DeMille film uh, with Victor Mature and um, uh, White Cargo, which is a, uh, another famous, I think her second famous, famous film. So Hedy Lamarr is in um, Hollywood. The second um, personality in my talk is George Antiel. He was a composer, born and uh, called himself the bad boy of music. He, he, he wanted to uh, really turn music on its head. Um, and uh, he was born and brought up in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, a suburb of Princeton that you may be familiar with just <laughs> to the south of here. Trenton makes the world takes. <laughs> Um, by age 18, he was um, teaching occasionally at the um, um, uh, Curtis Institute of Music that uh, Mary Louise Bach had, um, had endowed, and um, she eventually became his benefactor, and she supported him for the next 20 years. He went to Germany in 1922, where he met his future wife, Beschke Marcus, but Paris was where he wanted to be. Paris was the uh, center of, of uh, the new musical uh, revolution. Um, so he, he moved to Paris. Studied there with Nadia Boulanger, who was one of the foremost um, composer, teachers of composers uh, of that period. And uh, he lived, he and, Besh he and Beshke, uh, Marcus lived uh, in a room rented to them by Sylvia Beach, who was actually born and raised in Princeton, New Jersey, which you may also know, have heard of. Um, she had a shop on 12 Rue de Lodillon called Shakespeare and Company. And um, um, she rented out rooms to, um, to visiting um, uh, or expatriate uh, English-speaking artists and composers and writers. So the, there's a long list of people that, that, um, that stayed there. Perhaps the most famous one was um, um, James Joyce. Uh, she published uh, Ulysses in 1922 with her own money. And so it was in this uh, atmosphere that, um, that George Antille um, arrived in Paris. This is her shop, Shakespeare and Company. Um, and that's her in the window. Um, there's a lending library on the left, uh, I mean, a sign for lending library. Uh, she, she, she made it a, it was like a, um, a hangout for, for interesting beatnik types with uh, artistic bent. Um, this is uh, Sylvia Beach and James Joyce. Um, he was not blind in one eye, but uh, he had an eye problem. He believed if, if he gave the eye a rest, uh, it, it did better. So he often wore a black patch, but not always. But on the back, you can see background, the scandal of Ulysses and so on, the, the, the tremendous um, um, uh, event that was the, uh, the publication of, of Ulysses. Actually, she lost a lot of money on this. And um, uh, when the second, when the reprint, time for reprinting came, he found another publisher, which was unfortunate. So. Um, I think they had a falling out in the end, but, but at, that, at that time, this was a, a tremendous event. If you've been to Shakespeare and Company in Paris, this is the shop that you've been to. Um, it's, it's not um, Sylvia Beach's. Her shop closed in 1940 during the German occupation, and then George Whitman opened another shop, um, which is this one, and in 1964, when Sylvia Beach died, he renamed it Shakespeare and Company with her with her prior permission, actually. Um, and um, he did the same as she did. He, he opened up rooms for people to stay, for artists and, and composers and writers to, to stay in. Uh, he named his daughter Sylvia Beach. And when George passed away, she took over the shop. So Sylvia Beach Whitman now runs Shakespeare and Company. But it's not the same shop. 
Anyway, George Gente is in Paris. He idolized Stravinsky. He had a copy of Stravinsky's um, Sacré du Printemps, Rite of Spring, which he carried around with him everywhere. Um, this this uh, first performance of the Rite of Spring uh, was famous. In 1913, it had created a, created a riot in Paris, and uh, people still talked about it 10 years later, that uh, Stravinsky's um, uh, first performance of the Rite of Spring. George Antea ar arranged to arrive in Paris on the day that Les Nos was premiering, and, he, and so he went to the premiere of Stravinsky's Les Nos. So he had to compete. I mean, here, here are these riots that Stravinsky was creating. Here is this crazy um, uh, uh, literature that James Joyce was writing. Here are all these artists and, and um, uh, um, musicians and composers and writers hanging around Sylvia Beach's store. So he was very proud that in 1923 when a performance of his music, his own performance of his own music, created a small riot at the Swedish Ballet Company in Paris. Well, it turns out that the riot had been staged by a, by a movie producer. He didn't even know this, but a, a, after the riot settled down, the movie producer got back up on stage and said, you know, um, I didn't get this all on film. Can you please do it again? <laughs> <laughs> so the riot, you know, everybody was happy to have another riot and so. Um, but then um, Dudley Murphy, Fernand Leger and Man Ray uh, started a collaboration on an, artist, on an artistic film called The Ballet Mécanique. And they asked uh, George Ante if he would um, um, write the music for The Ballet Mécanique. Ante agreed um, and he started composing it, but the film was finished before his composition was, so he never made it into the uh, film. Nevertheless, he did eventually um, write the ballet mécanique, and here it is, uh, the first uh, few measures of it, um, 1924. It's scored for three xylophones, four bass drums, seven electric bells, 16 synchronized pianolas, which I'll talk about later, three aircraft propellers, <laughs> and one air raid siren. Uh, so here's a, a, a picture of the performance, uh, and I actually have, oops, um, I actually have uh, um, uh, the first 30 seconds of it, if you... <laughs> So it's not so crazy by modern standards. At the time, at the time it was pretty crazy music, but it's, it's actually pretty accessible. Um, but what I want to concentrate on is the 16 synchronized pianolas. The pianola or player piano was a very popular instrument in the late 1800s and up to about 1940s or so. Um, it, was a, it could be played as a regular piano, but it had a mechanism which would allow it to play by itself. There was, you would buy a, a roll of music, you can see the, you can see the sheet roll here, uh, which is punched with holes. Um, there's a picture of uh, the, the punched holes on a piano roll. Um, engineers would punch these holes by hand according to the, um, the score. And then um, there, there were uh, pedals down below which uh, you'd pump and it would uh, create a suction in the bellows and then as these holes passed over the um, uh, sensor um, that would cause the, the appropriate keys to, to uh, strike the, the, the piano strings. So the piano would play automatically. And Ante's idea was he would get 16 of these together with all these different piano rolls, um, possibly playing different things, and have them all play simultaneously in this uh, ballet mécanique. No way that would ever have worked. Uh, you, you just, there's, it's just too hard to synchronize uh, 
these piano rolls. The different pianos would operate at a slightly different speed. They'd get out of sync. It would just be a total mess. Um, but it was a great idea. And you know, by, by modern standards, you'd have to call this computer music. I mean, it, he's talking about programming a, a machine by punching holes in paper and having these machines play back on their own uh, uh, accord. So it's, um, it's very much like what we would now call computer music. And I imagine if he had lived 50 more years, he would have been very happy with all the um, wonderful uh, devices that, that are, are available for, for computer music. Well, it, it's pretty hard to make a living as a serious composer of far out music. And he discovered when he came back to New York that um, that despite the money that um, Mary Louise Bach was giving him, he could make a lot more if he wrote music for, for film. And so he eventually moved to Hollywood and started writing film music. Mary Louise Bach was furious about this. She had invested money and time in, who, in someone who she hoped would become one of the foremost American composers of his generation. And now he was throwing it all away and becoming a, um, a hack, uh, writing, writing, uh, writing movie music. But that's where he ran into, uh, into Hedy Lamarr. Lamarr had a room for inventing things. She, she fancied herself an inventor. Um, I don't know of any other inventions besides the one I'm going to talk about um, that, that really made a difference, but, but she worked hard at it. And, um, uh, she and Lamar became friends, uh, she and, and Hill became friends. Um, by the way, she was by then remarried. She was Hedy Markey at this point, the second of five not so well thought out marriages. Um, uh, but there is a story that um, she and, and uh, George and Hill were um, playing the piano together. That there's two versions of the story. One version has it that um, they were playing a duet where one voice would lead and the second voice would follow with the same notes, maybe in a different register. And then the first voice would lead and the second voice would follow. Or another story has it that they were playing a game where one plays several measures of a song and the other one recognizes the song and plays the next few measures. And then the first person plays the next few measures. So the two pianos are sort of talking to each other. But in any case, while while playing the piano with uh, Antiel, she had this realization that um, this technique would solve the problem of the torpedoes. Um, how, how can it do that? Well, if the transmitter transmits on different frequencies that hop around in the same way that the melody is hopping around, and if the receiver retunes the reception exactly in the same sequence, the same way the second voice is hopping around, then they'll be able to continue to talk to each other, but the enemy won't know what frequency they're on, and so the enemy won't be able to jam the frequency. Or if it tries to jam all, if the enemy tries to jam all the frequencies, it involves too much power, which is not possible. So her idea was, um, let's develop a system where the transmitter hops around in frequency and the receiver hops around in the same method in the same uh, sequence. And Thiel suggested, piano rolls. I know how to do this. Um, we can uh, have the transmitter and the receiver both using piano rolls, which are punched with the same sequence of gaps. And then when these gaps pass over the appropriate spot on the mechanism, um, a, a key, instead of having a, a piano key um, play a note, uh, a connection will be made, which will connect uh, to a different capacitor, and that will change the frequency, either of the transmitter or of the receiver. So, the, so they um, had the, he had the idea how to implement uh, Hedy Lamarr's idea. They spent months on it. Hedy Lamarr's drawing room was covered with diagrams. They talked with lawyers. They um, uh, they eventually worked up a patent. And in 1940, they applied for the patent and it was granted in 1942. The patent proposes a system of frequency hops 
between 88 frequencies, which is the number of keys on a piano or the number of, of uh, holes in a, in a piano roll. Um, of course, it didn't need to be 88, but I'm sure uh, Antail uh, uh, wanted to put this in as a bit of a joke on the, in, the, uh, in the patent. So here's the first page of the patent. It has the block circuit diagram for the receiver on top and the block circuit diagram sorry, for the transmitter on top and for the receiver on the bottom. It's signed uh, Hetty Kiesler Markey, Markey, which is her second husband's last name, and George Antiel and, uh, and their uh, attorney. Here's the second page of the patent. You can, I got these just from the US Patent Office. You can just go there and get beautiful high resolution uh, uh, scans of the, of the patent. Um, the second page shows um, uh, the torpedo with its trajectory being changed according to received um, directions from the transmitter. And it shows the piano roll, which will uh, change the um, uh, frequency. I checked, by the way, this piano roll doesn't, isn't a, a piece of music that you might know. I mean, you, you could imagine uh, uh, controlling a, a torpedo, you know, according to, say, um, uh, Chopin's mazurka in C sharp major or something. But, um, uh, but this, it should be random. And this shows the, um, the uh, mechanism by which the, the connections are made. And the patent goes on for 14 more pages explaining how, how all the pieces fit together. So they filed this patent with the hopes that um, the military would pick it up and use it. Um, they both uh, wanted to be part of the war effort and, uh, and um, um, Hedy Lamar did many things for the war effort. She, she went to visit troops, uh, she, she advertised for savings bonds and so on, uh, but, but this she thought could really make a difference. I first learned about this um, in 1990 from the Spread Spectrum Handbook. It's a technical book, but there's a, uh, the first article in this book is a historical article on spread spectrum communications. And the author of the article um, researched this. The uh, patent had been classified up until shortly before this time. And so uh, this book um, made the um, story uh, accessible to the whole spread, spread spectrum community. But then, um, Two years ago, Richard Rhodes wrote a book um, with many more details called Hetty's Folly. It's a, just a fantastic book. If you, if you are interested, um, this book has many more details than I can possibly cover today. Richard Rhodes, as you may know, is a Pulitzer Prize winner for his book on the making of the atomic bomb. And like that other book, uh, this one is very carefully researched. Every question you may have is, is answered here. Okay, so despite all their hopes, the, um, the, um, uh, the system wouldn't have worked uh, for the same synchronization problem. It's just too hard to get piano rolls synchronized. Um, the, um, the Naval Consulting Board looked at the patent and they said, <laughs> well, you're never going to get a piano inside a torpedo, so this is ridiculous. So, so in their infinite wisdom, they passed it up and, and went on to other things. But in 1954, 12 years later, the Navy came to the Hoffman Radio Corporation. So this is a radio made by Hoffman. They were the most advanced radio manufacturers in the country at the time. And they said, we want you to make us a system of sonobuoys, like this one, um, which will float in the water, record sounds from underwater, and then broadcast them to, uh, by radio to a passing airplane. Um, but we want you to use the frequency hopping technique so that the enemy will not be able to jam those, uh, th those messages. Um, the engineers at Hoffman Radio were given a copy of this patent, but the names were taken off, so they didn't know who it was. And one of the chief engineers later wrote a whole blog. Of course, this was all classified at the time, but one of the chief engineers later wrote a whole blog explaining that when they got this patent, they figured this must be top military um, scientists that wrote this patent, and they had no idea it was a, a movie star and a composer. Um, but they, they did um, uh, build these sonobuoys, 
they didn't use piano rolls. They used a mechanism that's more like a um, music box, a cartridge with uh, pins in it, which would rotate. And as it rotated, it would cause different connections to be made. And um, uh, that would change the frequency of the, of the transmitter and of the receiver. Each sono buoy would have its own uh, uh, code, its own music box. And um, the receiver on the ship or on the airplane would have um, one of these uh, uh, little cylinders uh, for each of the sonar buoys that it wanted to listen to. And when they wanted to listen to a different sonar buoy, they would take uh, the one cartridge out and put the other cartridge in. And that way there could be 10 or 12 of these uh, machines in the water at any time broadcasting uh, what they heard. The hope was to find enemy submarines. Uh, it didn't work. Um, not because the, um, the radio system didn't work, but because the sonar buoys were, were moving around in the water. You didn't know exactly where they were. The water was going over them, and uh, it was just too hard to keep track of. But the engineers then went on to build other, um, other um, frequency hopping systems, also classified. In, in later years, in the 1950s and 60s. And um, they, they learned the technique from, from this one. So in some sense, um, although the original patent was never realized, the ideas filtered into the, into the community. So frequency hopping is what it's, this technique is now called, when the transmitter bounces around between various frequencies. Um, the hops should appear to be random. If the, um, if the enemy figures out what sequence of hops you're using, then he'll again be able to jam, to jam the, uh, 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 the frequencies or else to, uh, to uh, listen in on, on what, uh, what is being said. On the other hand, the hops need to be completely um, reproducible because the transmitter and the receiver need to have exactly the same, uh, same system. So, so we call such a sequence pseudo-random uh, in mathematics. It's, it's, it should appear to be random by all, according to all statistical tests, but it's not really random. It's exactly repeatable. It needs to be exactly repeatable. It can also be used in a multi-user multi system. So there can be one set of frequencies, maybe the same 88 frequencies, say, um, but maybe 10 people uh, communicating at the same time. Each person or, for example, each sonar buoy would have its own sequence of hops. Uh, and so you'd need a system of several different sequences, maybe 10 or 20 different hopping sequences. And those hopping sequences should be sufficiently different from each other that they don't interfere with each other if they're operating at the same time. So now it's a, now it's a tough mathematical problem to find sequences of hops or a whole family of sequences of hops which appear random, which are easily reproduced, and which don't interfere with each other. Um, but such families have been found. And um, uh, so the hop sequence is designed to minimize, we call it a collision, when two, uh, uh, two transmitters end up broadcasting on the same frequency. Such sequences have been found. And for example, Bluetooth uses uh, frequency hopping. Uh, Bluetooth. Um, uh, not so many people here probably have one, but the younger generation has them. They have a, an earpiece that goes with their cell phone. And um, when you um, first buy the earpiece, you have to do what's called pairing the earpiece and the cell phone together, which means they agree on a um, sequence of hops. And then whenever either one of them detects that sequence of hops, they know that it's your earpiece talking to your uh, cell phone. And so you can be on the same, say, um, train car as 20 other people all listening to their Bluetooth earpieces, ear ear all on the same 79 frequencies without them interfering with each other because the hopping sequences have been chosen to interact as little as possible. 1,600 hops per second over 79 frequencies. Um, uh, frequency hopping is used in GSM cellular, in police radio, portable walkie-talkies, radio-controlled aircraft. There's many applications for frequency hopping. But the 
And TLMR system was largely ignored and forgotten, partly because it was um, classified, but partly also because in the 1960s, a striking new technique was discovered. And so I'd like to describe the new technique for you. It's more mathematical, uh, but more amazing. It's based on what I call a magic sequence. In ma mathematically, they call it M sequence, but the M doesn't stand for magic, it stands for maximal. But anyway, I call it magic sequence. So here's one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, one. Y typically, the magic sequences are maybe of size 1,000, but I picked one of which is only seven, seven bits long to show you how it works. Your receiver, say the cell phone, uh, knows this sequence. The transmitter, in this particular experiment, sends the same sequence over and over and over again. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Your cell phone receives this transmission and it remembers the last seven symbols, the last seven bits. Oops. And it compares them to the seven bits that it knows this, that the um, system is made up of. And as uh, time goes on, it's comparing the next seven bits to the next seven bits in the sequence because that sequence is being sent probably at very high speed. And with it, at each time, it calculates what we call a correlation, which is the number of agreements minus the number of disagreements within that block of size seven. So at the beginning, you can see, um, the, uh, the um, transmitted sequence exactly agrees with the, re with the uh, sequence that's in memory in the cell phone. We have seven agreements and no disagreements. The correlation is seven. At the next step, there's agreement here, agreement here, and agreement here. Three agreements and four disagreements. Three minus four is minus one. The correlation is minus one. At the next step, Agreement here, agreement here, agreement here. Three agreements, four disagreements. Correlation is minus one. At the next step, correlation is minus one. At the next step, correlation is minus one. At the next step, correlation is minus one. It's incredible. How can you find a sequence that does this? This is why I call it a magic sequence. This keeps happening. You correlation always minus one until finally you, you come back to the beginning of the sequence again, and then the correlation is seven. And after that, again, the correlation is minus one for seven more steps. So what happens in your cell phone is you get um, a small signal, a small signal, a small signal, and then suddenly a large signal, seven, and then minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, seven. Although actually in practice, these will be a thousand bits long. So you get minus one, minus one, minus one for a thousand steps, and then a thousand, and then minus one, minus one, minus one, and then a thousand. So this way of transmitting this signal is very immune to noise. If you have no a lot of noise or someone else transmitting on the same frequency, well, the minus ones might not be minus ones. They might be minus 10 or plus 40 or something. And the 1,000 might not be 1,000. It might be 900 or 800. But still, you get a huge signal that comes out every, every time uh, the, uh, the two um, sequences um, synchronize. These ideas are introduced by Saul Golem. He got his PhD at Harvard in 1957 in number theory, and he went to work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. They wanted to measure the distance to Venus. They had measured the distance to the moon um, previously by sending a uh, radar uh, pulse to the moon. They sent a very short pulse to the moon. It bounced off the moon. They measured how long it took, and they got the distance to the moon. But it didn't actually come back as a pulse. When, after, when, it, when the radar pulse hits the moon, well, there's rocks, there's craters, there's mountains. The pulse comes back all mushed up. It's not completely clear what is the right moment at which that pulse is returned. The pulse comes back a little bit at a time, uh, more at some times than other times. It's, a, it's very difficult to find an exact moment. And when they tried to do this with Venus, it just didn't work. They got garbage. So Saul Golem said, look, let's send a thousand bit long magic sequence of pulses to Venus and then see what comes back and correlate it with, with the magic sequence that we know. And 
so they'll be sending continuously the same magic sequence over and over and over again. And when it comes back, the correlations, although they won't be minus one, they'll be small, they'll be, they'll be noise. And then when the sequences line up, we'll get this huge pulse of, uh, of a thousand. And not only that, we get this huge pulse exactly at the moment that these sequences are lined up. So we'll be able to precisely time the boundaries between uh, successive periods of, of this magic sequence. And it worked like a charm. Uh, they, they were able to measure the distance to Venus with 100 times the accuracy that had been measured before. And this accuracy then had a huge effect on astronomy even. It allowed the astronomers to rec recalibrate um, Newton's constant big G and, and uh, it improved the um, accuracy of, of all astronomical calculations. Golem was awarded the National Medal of Science in last year, in 2012. Um, this idea of sending the magic sequence uh, over and over again to Venus um, filtered down into the cell phone industry. And soon people were using the same technique uh, for um, anti-jam uh, and multi-user systems. So here's how you send a message using, using magic sequences. The transmitter and receiver, just as in the Lamar and Tay system, the uh, transmitter and receiver will share the same magic sequence. So in this case, 0010111, let's say. If the transmitter wants to send the information bit, well, of course the transmitter is going to send digital data, so it's all ones and zeros. But if it wants to send a one, it sends the whole sequence. And if it wants to send a zero, it sends the opposite sequence. Now the correlation between uh, this sequence and the, and the um, signature sequence is, is perfect. You'll get correlation seven in this case, or correlation a thousand, if the, if the uh, sequences are size a thousand. And the correlation with the opposite sequence, these are all disagreements, so you'll get minus seven, or minus a thousand. But in all the off-synchronized, uh, out-of-phase, um, uh, um, uh, reception, uh, you'll have a very small correlation. So the receiver correlates the received sequence with the signature and, um, uh, in this, and then calculates the number of agreements minus the number of disagreements. So in this example, uh, the, the, um, the um, transmitter is sending one copy of the signature sequence, which is a, a one, and then another copy of the signature sequence, which is another one, then the reverse of the signature sequence, which is a zero, then the original one again, which is a one, then the reverse, which is a zero. So the information being sent here is one, one, zero, one, zero. That's what they're sending. But it gets amplified into this longer sequence, um, and the receiver then um, receives the signal like this. Uh, when they when the Sequences are lined up, the, the, um, the signal reads 1,000, and when they're not lined up, it, re it re reads minus one. When they're lined up, it receives 1,000, minus one. When they're out of exactly, the, when the opposite sequence is sent, it gives you a reading of minus 1,000. So again, this, um, this way of sending information is very immune to noise, and other uh, uh, users can use the same frequency band, and they'll have their own signature sequences, and they, they will interfere with each other only marginally. Of course, there will be interference. And so instead of getting this nice clean signal, you'll get something which is messed up with noise. But it, it won't be so messed up that you can't read what the original data was. And so that's the idea between, behind what's called code division multiple access. Every um, Cell phone, um, uh, when you turn it on, agrees with the uh, cell phone tower what signature sequence you're going to use, and then it encodes your message according to that signature sequence. This is proposed and used in GPS. Uh, GPS has 24 satellites. They all broadcast on exactly the same frequency, 1.57542. Each satellite has its own signature sequence, they are 1,023 bits long. Your GPS receiver knows all 24 of these sequences. 
when it receives a signal, it correlates that signal to each of those 24. When it finally does get a high signal correlation, it knows which satellite it's talking to. And so uh, it can detect simultaneously the satellites that are in the sky and the message that those satellites are sending and very accurately, which is the most important thing, very accurately the time at which that message was received. Once you know what time the message was received and what time the satellite thought it was, you know how far away that satellite is. If you get five or six such satellites, or actually you need is three or four, uh, then you can figure out exactly where you are. So that's how GPS works. Um, at the time, in the 1980s, uh, the GPS constellation was still being set up. Only half of the satellites were in the sky. No one was completely sure how well it was going to work. And um, the engineers at Qualcomm um, tried to convince the cell phone industry to use this technique. The cell phone industry, however, had another technique in mind, which is much less efficient. They were using what's called a time division multiple access. They would divide each second into hundreds, hundreds of a second, and each user would get a piece of that second. So there could be up to maybe 100 users at a time, and they'd all be broadcasting in, in um, your, your voice would be digitized and compressed into fractions of a second, and you got pieces of, of the second. The Qualcomm engineers um, did some computations and decided <clears throat> that this um, code division technique would increase the efficiency of the system by a factor of 40. It's just amazing. But nobody believed them. So they said, prove it. And Qualcomm did not have a lot of money. They had to run out to all their uh, investors and uh, come up with a couple million dollars and they finally um, um, got a system working and after that, the rest is history. Everybody uses, uh, uses um, code division um, uh, multiple access communications now. Um, let's see, um, there's a magic trick based on the magic sequence of length 31, which I was going to explain, but I'm running out of, ma running out of time. Um, I'll, just I'll just explain what happens in it, and if you're interested, I can tell you later how it works. Percy Diaconis invented this trick. Um, it involves um, putting um, a deck of cards, actually 31 cards, together in a certain order. You pass the cards out to the audience, tell them to cut the cards a few times, and then distribute the cards in order to a bunch of consecutive people. Tell us, tell, pick five of them and tell them to stand up and uh, think about the number they see, which card they have, and, um, and I, the magician, will tell you what card it is. And so these people are all thinking, looking at the cards, and the magician says, uh, think harder. And uh, still nothing, and he says, Come on, think harder. Everyone's going. <laughs> he says, I'm starting to get something now, but the reds and the blacks are getting confused. Uh, maybe if the reds step forward uh, a step. So the reds step forward a step. And he thinks, and he says, now I know what's going on. You've got the such and such card, and you've got the such and such card, and you've got the such and such card. So he invented this card, and it's a spectacular trick. He invented this trick based on a magic sequence of size of length 31. And, it, and the, the other property of the sequence, besides the fact that it um, um, has this correlation property, is that every window of size 5 only appears exactly once inside this sequence. The window, which has 10101, never appears anywhere else in that sequence. So he arranges the cards so that the reds correspond to uh, zeros and the blacks correspond, or is it the other way around? The reds correspond to ones and the blacks correspond to zeros. And so when the reds move forward, five of the reds, he, five, out of the five people, when the reds move forward, he sees what the patterns of reds and blacks are, which gives you the patterns of ones and zeros. And so he knows exactly where in the sequence he is, and from that he can, 
decode what card it is. I, I don't have time to tell you how to encode the cards, but it's not so hard. You just have to find a way to encode uh, five binary digits as a, as a card in a suit. Um, so I'd like to discuss why it's called spread spectrum. When you turn on your cell phone, it broadcasts um, at a radio frequency, but there's no information, no signal on it. It's just a straight broadcast. Um, so I have a, a high frequency sine wave, sine AT. Um, and if you look at a frequency versus power graph, all the power is just at this one frequency that your cell phone is broadcasting on. The frequency is A in this case. Now suppose you send a signal over that uh, cell phone. You start talking. Or maybe I'll do something easier. Let's suppose you send just a single tone, a tone of frequency B. Then the signal that's broadcast will look like this. The, the high frequency uh, radio signal gets modulated by this uh, low frequency audio signal. Frequency uh, B is the audio, and the uh, frequency A is the, is the radio frequency. If you figure out what, where the power is uh, being broadcast in this situation, it turns out that it's being broadcast at frequencies um, A plus B and A minus B. It sounds weird because the transmitter is only tuned to frequency A, but uh, uh, this is actually a result of a trig identity which you're supposed to have learned in high school. I'm sure you all remember it. It's that um, uh, uh, two sine AB cos T is sine of A plus B and sine of A minus B, which means that a, a, there's a, you can get this waveform by adding up two sine waves, one at frequency A plus B and the other at frequency A minus B. But your cell phone's not broadcasting a tone, it's broadcasting a digital signal. If you broadcast a digital signal, you're sending square waves instead of sine waves. And if you do the same analysis, you find that you get a whole bunch of frequencies, all separated by B. So the original frequency is A, and then the power comes out at A plus B, A plus 2B, A plus 3B, A plus 4B at smaller and smaller amounts, and A minus B, A minus 2B, A minus 3B. So the signal is being sent at all these multiple frequencies at the same time, and in other words, the spectrum has been spread out. But this is also what the um, Lamar and Thiel system does. In the Lamar and Thiel system, the, the transmitter is jumping between these frequencies at a very high rate of speed. In the code division technique, it's broadcasting on all these frequencies, but other than that, the two techniques are extremely similar. Um, this is a picture of, the, um, of Wi-Fi, which works uh, by, by the spread spectrum technique. Um, uh, Wi-Fi uses the, uh, in other words, wireless internet access. It uses a 2.4 gigahertz band. It's divided up into 14 channels. Each channel has its single frequency that the, uh, that the transmitter is broadcasting on, but when, it, when a signal, a digital signal modulates that frequency, it gets spread out. And so each of the channels, um, the, the spectrum is spread and, the, and you get overlaps. Uh, between the uh, different channels, but nevertheless, because of this correlation technique, uh, even if you have someone on channel one and someone on channel two in the same room, they, they can still um, receive Wi-Fi. However, if you have more than 14 people in the same room, uh, the band get, really gets over full, and, um, and then you, you can't use Wi-Fi anymore. As you may have discovered, for example, if you go to an airport, and, you, and it says free Wi-Fi at this airport, and you try to connect, and you just you can't connect because there's just too many people. The system wasn't designed to handle a thousand people in the same room; it's designed to handle several people. But but it is very similar uh, to to the frequency hopping technique of of Lamar and Antio. I'd like to finish with two famous quotes from Hedy Lamar. She. <laughs> She was um, um, uh, r rather dismissive of the culture of, of Hollywood, even though she capitalized on it in a very big way. So one quote was, any girl can be glamorous. 
all you have to do is stand still and look stupid. <laughs> and the other quote that I like um, is um, uh, from uh, 1997. So as I mentioned, the, the story came out in around 1990 about the uh, patent that had been um, uh, written by her and by George Gentile and that had been classified for so many years. And uh, a few years later, the Electronic Frontier Foundation decided that they should give her the Pioneer Award. It's an award they give once a year to someone who's done something really fantastic. And it's clear that her work was 20 years uh, ahead of its time. Uh, they couldn't implement it at the time, but, but those ideas eventually became extremely important. So they gave her the Pioneer Award when she was 85 years old. And she, in her acceptance speech, said only one thing, it's about time. <laughs> And I agree. Thank you.